Uh, this is Gopitra Dethiraj, who is the founder of India Spend, which was India's first data driven public interest journalism non profit. Um, he runs a non profit and he runs a for profit. So we yeah, have no a profit yet. Well, well, no profit yet. Always oh, in the distant uh, future. <laughs> so we have interesting things to talk about. Let me first set the ground a bit. You know, all of us come from what is called the old media, which is newspapers and television. Um, and uh, for the first time, I think in India, we are seeing the, uh, uh, the flowering of opportunity uh, of the digital media. Uh, let me very briefly put this in perspective. Uh, what's happening is that very, that very clearly there's a problem with the print media and uh, the uh, television, uh, television and uh, uh, well, specifically television, uh, in the sense that they are more under pressure than they've ever been. They are uh, under pressure professionally and they are under pressure uh, as far as the business model goes. Uh, very frankly, the business model is, uh, is crumbling. In television, it's very clear. There are about 900 channels uh, today in India, uh, of which just a handful uh, make money. Uh, and of half those channels are controlled by five advertising agencies. Uh, so essentially, uh, all the money has to be routed through these advertising agencies. In the print media, things are, um, they look pretty good. People think that uh, Indian newspapers uh, are, uh, are doing pretty well compared to, the, compared to other parts of the world. But uh, within, if you if you work in newspapers, you know that the trend is not very good at all, uh, and um, it's quite obvious that things, even in India, are moving towards digital space. Uh, the print media have been around for so many years, uh, decades actually, um, uh, more than a century. But um, even today, uh, the overall turnover of the print media is uh, about a third the turnover of Airtel. Uh, the mobile phone company which started in 1995. Uh, so you can make out how small the print media are really are. Uh, before I hand it over to um, uh, both Govind and Naresh, let me just quickly tell you that in 2012 was the first year that mobile internet users in India uh, exceeded the number of desktop internet users. Uh, today we have about uh, 200 million internet users in India, of which 155 million access uh, the, the net on the cell phone. Uh, next year, there will be more internet users in, in India than the US, and by 2018, we'll have double the number of internet users uh, than the uh, US. Uh, and the internet user base in India has grown 285% over the last two years. Uh, and between 2010 and 2013, uh, data charges have dropped by 90%. And 70% of internet users are people like you, uh, below the age of uh, 35. So for the first time, there is an opportunity to focus uh, not as much on profits, uh, but uh, on the opportunity itself of the digital media. So let me begin um, uh, by asking um, uh, Naresh first uh, why and how he set up Scroll. Uh, uh, the short answer is that nobody else would employ me. So I was forced to create my own employment. <clears throat> so this is a sort of challenging moment, as you pointed out. Uh, in 1996, I went to uh, Columbia University, when for the first year they were offering something that they called a course in new media. And uh, I had just come out, I've never traveled out of India before, and uh, I landed up there, and I, the, the computer was sort of had been established, but all of these new technologies were emerging. So on our first day in class, everybody, including the American students, had to be shown how to use this new program called Windows, which nobody had seen before. And we were taught all these magical things. There was something called a mouse. And we were taught how to drag and drop, uh, which nobody had seen before. Uh, 20 years since then, uh, uh, sort of uh, many of my, I mean, we were all convinced that you know this was going to be the way of the future. Nobody was quite sure how. Uh, 20 years later, we all know how to drag and drop, but we're still not quite sure how. Uh, Columbia now calls this class the digital media class. Uh, but out of my Columbia class of about 80 people, uh, only 40, I think, are still in journalism, uh, if that at all, because. This new thing 
uh, has destroyed the old newspapers, but there isn't any new model that's been set in place. Um, for scroll, we realized that uh, you know the the, the old the sort of uh, newspapers do some things very well. They report from the ground, often in a really fabulous way. But we realized what we thought is it was an opportunity to put the news in perspective. So we're not attempting to replicate what the newspapers do, but we're attempting to say why the news that has happened is important. Um, Digital is a fabulous way of distributing. Uh, when we started, and we started on January the 26th, just for the heck of it, we set ourselves a target of getting 200,000 readers by the end of the year. Uh, we now have about 5 million, so way beyond our expectations. Uh, we're still not sure how this translates into revenue, so we're still approaching this uh, in, in the manner of an experiment, but it's clear that there are readers and there are readers for all sorts of things, including the slightly quirky things that we do. Govan, why did you start now? Uh, Govan started IndiaSpend.org. If you haven't seen it, please do see it. Uh, IndiaSpend is a data-driven public interest journalism uh, non-profit, as I said. So why uh, data-driven and why non-profit? Okay, so. Uh, I guess like Naresh, I mean, I'm also a product of circumstances in some way. So the last uh, organization I worked with and I created sort of from ground up was Bloomberg uh, uh, Television in India. Uh, but so my background is financial journalism. I've, I've only done that for the last more than 20 years. So uh, Bloomberg actually, when we came in, uh, and, and I counted some of these things later. So there were about 34 or 35 business news products in this country, way more than any other country, I mean, including the United States. Of these uh, 35, there are about six business news channels. Uh, what I set up was the fifth, and I worked with uh, the first one, which was CNBC before that. Uh, it was quite clear to me, even as we set up and as we were uh, fighting it out in the market, that uh, there was oversupply. Uh, and it's a fairly, I mean, in many emerging economies and so on, you see this phenomenon. There's one successful business, uh, many, many more uh, coming. There's one successful literary uh, festival, many more coming. 70, as I understand, at last count. So uh, uh, the whole point was that uh, we were in a, I mean, we were in a media surplus environment with uh, 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 with one kind of product trying to do the same thing uh, across the same genre. So therefore, for let's say uh, Hindi tel Hindi news, you had you have about 17 or 18 channels. Telugu, you have maybe 18 or 19 channels. English, I think there are six or seven. Uh, business news, there are six channels plus. Uh, about six newspapers, five magazines, wire services, uh, and so on and so on. So, anyway, so all of this is, uh, I mean, if you look at it now, as a, if I were to really apply the, uh, uh, the sort of rules of uh, business, as I've learned as a financial journalist, this is just not tenable. You can't have a situation where there are so many people trying to serve one small sliver of an audience. So that's, in some ways, the backdrop. India Spend specifically was actually born out of the Anna Azari movement, uh, and let me explain how. Uh, so like everyone, I mean all of you in, uh, in this room, you, I was watching uh, it very closely and I was quite carried with it. I mean, you know, I mean, Anna Azari sort of coming out, uh, making corruption uh, uh, an issue of, on, on, I mean, center staging the issue of corruption, uh, convincing uh, a lot of people who had never been convinced to come out literally on the streets to protest. Involving young people, uh, which was again a first in some, uh, in many ways, or after at least a, after many many decades, and the use of social media and innovations like that. So the the Janupal, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Anasari movement progressed and evolved and sort of uh, converged or wanted to converge on the Janupal bill being the solution to corruption as we knew it. <clears throat> and that's where I guess many of some of us started differing because I people like me felt that Janupal was not the uh, solution necessarily. But you surely have to give Anazari credit for what he created and what he started. So the the my inspiration in some ways was the flip. The the good thing was that Anazari had used emotion to bring people out together, right? For the first time, uh, and which is what uh, in many ways Arvind Kejriwal capitalized on and built Amadmi Party and uh, you know sort of won the daily elections. What he done did subsequently is a different story. So. Uh, 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 so the power of emotion was immense, right? and clearly for the first time India was seeing the sort of groundswell of emotion, particularly amongst them. The problem as I saw it was that uh, emotion without some blend of numbers and data was in many ways wasted. And I could see that in the Anasari movement itself. So, so my sort of in, uh, working hypothesis was that unless you blend 
got at least 10 percent, 15 percent data with emotion, you will never achieve the kind of change you want to achieve in this country. And that's really what this is about. They're saying that we want to bring about change. We think that the education system sucks. We think that uh, healthcare sucks. But if you want to do something about it, then you need to have something more concrete. So saying that education sucks and say that sack the education minister is not going to solve the problem. But an understanding of how the government spends its money, why it does so much money go into a midday meal scheme, uh, which is almost one third of the education budget, by the way. Should teachers be cooking meals or should they be teaching? If those teachers are cooking meals and teaching, are they being measured for outcome uh, when it comes to teaching or the quality of teaching? Why is it that a class uh, four student can't do class one math in this country? Right? Uh, why is it that uh, we talk about uh, uh, rape uh, so loosely without knowing that 90% of rape cases are in 90% in of rape cases the perpetrator is known to the victim? So what, what's the what's the sort of result of all of this? The result is that your policy approach first your public discourse and then your policy approach will change if you only knew know or give more credence to the data that sort of is is so important in understanding issues and. So, we said India spend will focus on education, healthcare, issues of public interest. Then the second thing of course was how do we uh, run it and, and I'll just finish this and I'll stop there. The, uh, we said first, okay, can we do this uh, uh, in the traditional advertising model? Uh, I think very quickly, and I did talk to people and so on, very quickly it became clear that it wouldn't. Right? There were no advertisers would come in. Most unlikely that even uh, private equity or venture capital would come in because this is not, an, this is not Flipkart. Right? This is about doing something far more fundamental. So then we took the fundamental call that let's build this as a non-profit. And I'd seen a few similar examples uh, in, in North America and Latin America and so on, where you know people were actually creating very interesting journalism models. And that's a separate discussion. You know, what are the kind of journalism models that can do well and so on? So we said let's create it as a, a, a non-profit and let's seek donations. You know, and see what where it goes. So three of us, uh, we were trustees. I mean, I became managing trustee. So we put in some of our own savings and we got it going. And then we went to uh, uh, donors and we said this is what we want to do. So lesson number one, uh, most people don't take journalists seriously. Right? I don't mean journalists seriously as in the, for the journalism you do, but your ability to actually set up something which is credible and has, uh, uh, you know, has some traction and so on. Or rather they want to see you first show something, or proof of concept, you know, show that you can deliver and they so, you know, you write well, you're great, uh, you're great in television, but they're not sure whether you can actually run something uh, seriously. So anyway, so that was lesson number one. So we went, uh, then I went and I started approaching people and uh, and I found that people were interested in this. So they said, oh, it's interesting that you're doing data. So it turned out that our first, uh, the, one of our first large donors was actually a guy who ran, uh, runs a private equity firm in Bombay, right? So when we were talking to him, he said, are you uh, pushing this, are you showing this to me as a for-profit venture or a not-for-profit? He says, if it's for profit, I have, uh, let's, have a, let's sort of conclude this conversation here, have a cup of tea and uh, let's go. Uh, if, if it's a not for profit, I'm interested. Right? So here was a guy who's, uh, who sort of, uh, uh, you know, literally a sort of bloodthirsty private equity guy, who's, who was saying that I'm, I'd rather pack this with non profit capital than with pro for profit capital because this fits into that sort of, you know, this is where you fit. And that sort of, you know, set some sort of, you know, whatever, uh, light bulbs kind of going off. So, and, and subsequently we noticed that uh, many people said that, including those who are astute investors said that separate the two. You know, do not uh, confuse, uh, uh, in, I mean, a good intent with the desire to make profits. So, that's really the story of India spent so far and uh, uh, we've been around for two years. Uh, our Content is sort of we are more a B two B now. I mean, uh, I mean, while we are also on online and social media and so on, uh, our stuff is now seen on a whole bunch of newspapers. Uh, Sujoy, editor of Oharado, who's walked in, is going to uh, print our first story tomorrow, I think, or tonight. Huh? Three stories. Three stories. Yes. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, also our stuff appears on Dow Jones, Yahoo News, Hindustan Times takes our stuff. We collaborate uh, with uh, uh, columnists and so on, Indian Express. Uh, Mirror, uh, not Times of India, but the Mumbai Mirror, Bangalore Mirror, some of the lead regional language publications. So that's how we're growing and we've got a long way to go. Thank you. I think at the bottom of all this is uh, a big disillusionment with the uh, legacy media, the uh, mainstream mass media as it were. Uh, and certainly I think all three of us are products of the disillusionment amongst journalists. There are lots of journalists who have dropped out of the mainstream media simply because of the evisceration of uh, uh, the independence uh, of the mass media. 
so that is one thing that is certainly driving this. Um, but uh, there's more to it than just uh, disillusionment with the mass media. Um, Naresh, would you like to uh, tell us uh, uh, what is driving uh, the start of uh, uh, digital media in India? Well, to begin with, this, the enormous spread of smartphones. And so um, most people now are not reading on a desktop computer or not yet on a tablet, but everybody's reading on a smartphone. And they want to know immediately what's happening. So the moment something breaks on TV, they want to be able to put that in context quite quickly. And so I think that's what sort of is, is the big push. And as Rajdeep said yesterday, uh, just drop. This is among the things also that drove the Modi campaign. That even though internet penetration seems to be quite low, uh, there's actually a lot of young people reading uh, all sorts of things, uh, and I think that's the, the the major driver for now. But is there uh, what about the entire question of credibility? I mean, it's quite obvious that lots of readers have problems with the with the credibility of the mass media, whether the print or television, which is why they tend to go uh, online. Uh, so how I think the question of the credibility of online media is still actually all up in the air because there are as, and there's so many organizations that are completely partisan uh, and so much of the Narendra Modi campaign was driven by seemingly independent news organizations. I mean, things like Niti Central that wanted to set themselves up as news sources but were actually completely funded uh, by a certain direction. So I, I think that you know it will be a, a while before credibility is established. Uh, but you know that's what that's our challenge to show that we do a range of stories across an ideological spectrum that uh, wins you uh, sort of uh, readers who believe in what you're saying. Do you also believe, uh, and I'm asking both of you, that uh, the uh, the scope of uh, news coverage is uh, expanding in India thanks to digital media? Because what we have seen in the mainstream media is there are only uh, and more and more. Only certain things get covered, the daily news, uh, the daily news cycle and anything flowing out of that. And there are vast areas that are important to this country that simply have fallen off the news radar entirely. Um, uh, do you think that is one uh, great uh, uh, opportunity that uh, the digital media has? Yeah, so I, I surely think it's an opportunity and you know, it's about, finally it is about product. I mean, you know, so having worked in the Times group for five years, we learned a few things about, you know, product and positioning and of course revenue and so on. So the reason, for, let's say, India's spent is positioned so, so sharply as a data journalism initiative is because it's a clear product. You know, there's no, I mean, there's no ambiguity on what we are trying to do and how and how we are trying to do it. I mean, whether the product in itself meets your expectations is something that I with that. But we're very clear about what, what we are trying to do. So therefore, the opportunity is there. I think the larger challenge is clearly how do you fund these things, right? Because it's very tempting for us to, to do, let's say, uh, on-ground reporting from different parts of the country, backed by data, and we've done some very interesting work uh, which someone has, uh, has led. But the thing is that, uh, uh, can we, to what extent can we support it, and how do we support it? And I think that's something that the digital world has to be very, very careful about, because the fact is that the digital world is a frugal world. It's not uh, it's it's not big uh, mainstream media in in any way, including the fact that it doesn't. Uh, it's nowhere near in terms of the revenues that uh, mainstream media gets. So yes, if you've got a very generous uh, philanthropists who are backing you, I mean, uh, uh, then maybe you, you will take uh, uh, bigger sort of risks or bigger exposures. But otherwise, I would think that uh, you have to tread very carefully and choose a few things and do those well. So uh, choosing a few things. How do you uh, choose what you choose? Because it's quite obvious that you have filled certain niches. Uh, how do you choose those niches and uh, where do you intend to? I wish I had the sharp business mind of my old schoolmate, Govind Rajayati Raj. But first, uh, sort of, we have a very small business side. They live in fear of me because if they ever use the word product, I pounce on them and I tear their hair off. And sort of, uh, uh, I really believe we produce a publication which has a completely different set of resonances and relationships. You have a relationship with a reader. Uh, you're not, when you call something a product, I, I uh, would uh, submit, then you're selling to an advertiser. Uh, and uh, so, first I think we produce a publication. No, and I, can, I, can I come back on that? So, I think product is, the product is something that is defined sharply uh, in the minds or to the mind of the reader. I'm not, like, Indian Bank, for instance, doesn't even take advertising, so there's no question of advertising. 
I think anything you do, uh, whether digital or otherwise, has to be sharp in intent and focus. I mean, scroll is sharp in intent and focus, whatever you may uh, say, right? It's filling some, at least three or four, as someone pointed out, gaps. So that makes it a product. I mean, now, how you... Uh, no, I think most of the publication makers, publications are always... Um, I'm like a... I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I think a product, a piece of soap, you know what it's going to be like every day. A publication is constantly a work in progress. You respond to readers, you take about feedback. It's a constantly changing thing within broad parameters, maybe even more narrow parameters, but anyway, so let, let's, let's, uh, you know, no, no, basically, wait, 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 I have to stop you there because let us just clarify here that there are some, those of us who have passed through the portals of the Times of India have been damaged by the word product. Yeah. Uh, very clearly because uh, Samir Jain, who is the, uh, the head of the Times of India uh, at his school of journalism, um, uh, well, I passed through that uh, school of journalism as well as did he. Uh, famously used to come and hold up, uh, say, but give his lectures by holding up a newspaper and holding up a soap and saying, there is no fundamental difference between these two. They are both products. So, which is why Naresh feels uh, like he does. But now carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, now you very clearly focus on culture. There's a lot of very interesting things on culture. On culture, we yes. focus on, on politics. Yes. Uh, and so those are the things that we think we want to do. So uh, how did you decide that you would focus on these? And so again, there was no market survey, there was no going out. This is horribly egotistical. We decided that these were the things that interested us, these were the things we liked to do, and so we were going to do it. And we decided that if we did it with some passion and interest, perhaps it would interest a few other people. And so far, that's the way it's worked. I, this is the way I've always run publications. Uh, before this, I did a, a more culture driven thing called Time Out. And again, on the face of it, you know, people should not have been interested in Kuchi Puri performances in, sorry, in Matonga, but they were. And I think that if something interests you, you can pretty much make the bet that it's going to interest a few other people. And the fact that it's not seen anywhere else, I think, I mean, which is, I mean, hate to use the word product again, but that's what it is, right? I mean, you found a niche. Uh, you're building on that niche and you're uh, responding to what your readers want or what you think they should want. I mean, yeah. So there's a lot of seat of the pants flying involved. Uh, because quite obviously, uh, neither of you ever conducted a market survey or anything of the sort. Uh, so, all right. So, so if I can just sort of drop it again, I think the fundamental difference is that sort of publication by market survey uh, is. You, you hold a mirror to the reader and you say, ah, this is what the reader wants, we will reflect what they want. And I think really publications are about uh, opening windows to the world. And uh, you say, there's all this stuff out there, you don't know it. Uh, and that's what I think we're attempting to do, you know, holding the mirror. Think, uh, window, opening the mirror. I, you know, there is a fundamental shift, I think, uh, and we did talk about the Times of India. Times of India is very clear. 75% uh, uh, of our revenue comes from advertisers, therefore advertiser is our uh, sort of uh, key customer, right? There's no two ways about that. So, uh, where is, uh, and, and this is about startups, right? I think a lot of our startups, including us, and we are, we're going to launch a, a television digital venture as well called Boom. We're the TV partners for this uh, conference as well, uh, which is going to focus on impact again, uh, but through video, right? So, we're saying that basically, uh, uh, there is there are people who have not seen this or not consumed this, and there is a, a, a market for this, as in people want it, and we can see it too. Uh, uh, and for whom advertisers are, uh, I mean, for us, advertisers are not our principal uh, this thing. We are saying, okay, how do I, I mean, with India Spend or Boom, how do I reach all of you and say that, okay, here's some journalism that at least attempts to be different and attempts to tell a story, right? So I'm not trying to say, okay, how will I convince Hindustan Lever or Colgate or, uh, you know, uh, whatever, Reliance Geo about how, what. Uh, good journalism is. I'm trying to convince you, and of course, which eventually will take us to the next step. If it's good journalism, if it's good uh, in, insightful, will you then pay for it? Well, the thing is, the digital media startup is an extremely exciting uh, creature. But the point is, I think there's obviously going to be a very high attrition rate. Already, there are um, uh, startups that I like. I visited this uh, Mumbai boss, which did a really nice job of covering. Restaurants and culture in uh, in in in, uh, in Bombay, and I suddenly find it's dead. It's uh, shut down completely. So, uh, and at some point, I think that uh, the mainstream media are going to, as the transition to digital media and the cell phone grows, 
at some point, uh, the mainstream media are going to kick in here, and they, of course, have very, very deep pockets. How confident of you of being able to survive uh, that uh, pushback uh, when it comes? And it will come. I mean, in the, in the case of data journalism, you can already see the newspapers um, uh, already get, trying to get into uh, data journalism, trying to work with numbers, etc. Uh, and at some point, there is a great chance that your offerings might become uh, redundant. And this is the same this case with you. The Times of India, I remember, at one point um, had um, uh, veered away completely from uh, hard news and they said there's no need for all this. It's fine to run with uh, uh, gossipy kind of news, etc. And they did. Uh, and at some point they realized that they need to veer back. And they veered back so sharply uh, that other publications that had occupied the niche of so-called hard news um, uh, succumbed, uh, really was swept away by that. How do you think, how easy do you think it would be to uh, it survive? Won't be, it won't be easy to already. There are about three or four major online sites that are going to start. You know, when we started, we decided that we were going to do what the news magazine used to do at the end of the week take all the stories and put them in perspective. We thought we would do that at the end of the day. The news magazines have now, are now in really dire trouble. Uh, and much of that has just has to do with the, the model of physically printing and distribution, which takes up so much of their, their, their costs. And so I think digital can do that much better. Uh, we've got a great distribution mechanism. Uh, it's still unclear how the revenues will, will compensate for it. But it's clear that, at least in terms of the magazine space, we've got an advantage. Let's talk a bit about uh, the personal effort that's required. Now, Naresha works about 15 hour days, and uh, he pretty much edits the um, scroll entirely. What happens when you fall sick? Do you continue editing? Uh, now I have a fabulous uh, assistant, so uh, I, I can occasionally I'm allowed to fall sick. Uh, or sneak out of my room and attend discussions. But do you feel that this is a treadmill that you can't get off? Because 15 hour days, every day, there's no... no I, I think break. we're at the stage where we're just starting and we're growing quite quickly and we weren't certain how much staff would take. And so there's a slight lag between hiring people and what we actually produce. But I think we'll settle down into an equilibrium quite soon, I hope. Yeah, I'll respond to your earlier point as well. I think uh, there is a huge opportunity for independent media. Right? And what does independent media mean? I mean, I mean, I'm also struggling with this definition in some ways. So, one is that it's independent from advertisers. Right? I think that that's the primary thing. Because once you're dependent on advertisers, your entire product is fashioned by what advertisers want or the reach that they want, whether it's TV or, or print. The second is that finding the niches which maybe a lot of other people are not touching, which are important and touch our hearts in, in many ways. So, whether it's culture or you know some of the more harder stuff that we take up in India spend. I think so. Uh, that that's also sort of you know fits into the, the larger definition of independent. I think the opportunity for independent media, and I look at other countries. I mean, you know, India may not. India just seeing a few of us. I mean, you know, we are on the point of you know what will happen in MoCA. I think we still need far more uh, uh, and focused uh, uh, initiatives, which uh, which and then perhaps we can talk about is there oversupply and so on. I think so. We need far more independent media. Uh, if I look at Latin America, Western Europe, uh, to some extent North America as well, I think there are some excellent examples of what people are trying to do. Each of and each of them is not only just independent but also innovative in terms of how they're funding it, whether it's combination of uh, philanthropy, uh, some kind of revenue model, uh, but definitely not relying on the traditional advertiser-based model, and therefore they are able to create great. Uh, uh, products. I mean, you know, very. I mean, great uh, uh, newspapers or great online magazines. So I think the future is very bright, as I see. Uh, and I don't any for any organization that's enslaved by uh, print. I mean, uh, advertising. The advertising model will always find it difficult to come after this because the advertising model will allow you to do a lot of things, but not everything. Aren't you stuck a bit in the chicken and egg syndrome? Because, for example, you desperately want to grow and you want to put in all these refugees from the mainstream media floating around and you put me in and I'm also a refugee. I work for Indespen by the way. Uh, so he put me in. But how do you put in people when you can't afford them? Uh, and yet, if you want to make a greater impact, then you need to pull in more people. But you don't have enough money to do that. How do you break out of that cycle? Yeah, so it's a tough question. But I think, let me put it this way. I think uh, our industry has been spoiled by uh, uh, I mean, sort of, I mean, I think this industry has been overpaid in, in some ways. Uh, I think some of us, I mean, I come from television, so we're even, I was even more spoiled. But, uh, uh, you know, the thing is that we all got used to thinking that uh, 
we are, we are going to sort of get equated with the Citibank head of treasury or something like that. You know, or an IM and the bar guy who's working for a duty people for 10 years. We can't. I mean, this is not a profession that's, uh, I mean, I think it should, yes, take care of uh, your basic needs, but it's not a profession that's meant to, uh, you know, uh, give you uh, the same status as the people I just talked about. And I think that, I think a lot of journalists have to do this post connection. Uh, I mean, you know, I, yeah, and, I, and, and, and TV has, I mean, I would admit it has quite the market in many ways, right? Uh, it's like that. It's like e-commerce. I mean, why, uh, why is or e-commerce or Uber or something like that, right? Why is why is that? Uh, why is it that I'm paying less for a, a taxi ride from airport to my house than what the petrol cost is? It's because some venture capital is subsidizing it, right? So it, this can't last. I mean, you know, it, the same thing happened. Not venture capital, but other capital subsidized uh, the ambitions and excesses of uh, television entrepreneurs between 2000 and 2010, and now the bubble is breaking because the business model has gone, gone past. So eventually, I think people have to understand this is not a, this is not a steel company that we're setting up. This is not Uber. This is not uh, Flipkart. It's a it's a media world, and the media world is about being frugal and running things. So I didn't mean to suggest that there's no money, and I think it's just that we have to find new money. And so in the old system, you went to an advertiser, and that subsidized uh, that sort of cross uh, paid for what you were doing. In this new world, we will have smaller slivers of revenue from multiple sources. It takes more money to get it. It will be a combination of, of syndication, of technology sales, uh, of, a whole bunch of little different things. I think it can pay for itself, which is why we have decided to do this. That we will cover our costs and we will pay our journalists and we will have money to travel and do the stories that matter. It's just that it takes much more work. It, it's not the old assumption anymore. We could go on indefinitely, but I'd really like to open it up for uh, questions. Uh, if if there are no questions, we'll of course continue. But if you have questions, just put up your hand and um, feel free to uh, ask these gentlemen uh, anything. Uh, yes. You, know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned politics is one area that's full covers. What are the gaps in political coverage that you see in the mainstream media that you think Stroll has been able to address over the past? I think uh, what we're trying to do is interpret why this matters, why those announcements matter, why the why those debates in parliament matter. I don't know. Uh, that, that, that's the one thing I don't think the newspapers respond to swiftly enough. There was an interesting point that he made. I thought that the fact, well, the fact that journalists uh, in India, essentially, what he's saying is are overpaid right now. Uh, in, in, in some slivers, not everything. Well, yes, sure. Yeah, but I mean, all of them, all of us began with journalism because, of course, you know, more of a calling. We jumped on our motorcycles and went everywhere. Now we have, you know, houses and uh, in some cases cars. He doesn't have a car. He travels by public transport, by right? bus everywhere. Uh, but I think it is an opportunity, in a sense, for journalists to be true to themselves. But uh, do you think it's fair to ask uh, journalists to um, uh, essentially cut back? I don't know if people have to cut back. I think uh, TV, is, two, TV is overpaid. The sort of print journalists that I work with, I think are earning realistic salaries uh, given their levels of education. Most people I work with have postgraduate degrees. Uh, in many of them are quite specialized. Uh, they live in metropolises. There's a sort of reasonable uh, standard of living that they should maintain. And I think we have the, the revenues exist for everybody to live comfortably, not not like our money, but... Uh... But of course, the other thing that we've, uh, we, we forgot to mention is that we are only talking about journalists, and all of us have been journalists, but the digital space, I think, allows a lot of non-journalists to get into um, the area of what would conventionally have been called journalism. And the people who have pulled in the most money, for example, uh, in the space, have been, uh, what's it called? Scoop Poo Poo. Scoop Poo Poo. Uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, how many of you actually follow Scoop Poo, but I'm sure many of you do. Uh, is again, is built on these cute videos and viral videos of dogs, cats, and what have you. Uh, but uh, Scoop Poo has drawn in, uh, while we struggle for, you know, whatever, 100,000, uh, uh, equal to 100,000 dollars, they just drew 60 million dollars, was it? Uh, uh, I think more 60 crore. 6 million dollar valuation. Okay, whatever, much more money than we can even dream of. So there's a great opportunity, I think, to expand uh, the definition of journalism uh, itself. Uh, and certainly, uh, uh, most of the people who work for India Spend, uh, I'm the first journalist. 
All the others are not judges. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, so in India Spend, I think they basically, uh, I mean, it's, it's also a way of, uh, I mean, acknowledging that the market, uh, you know, when you're trying to build something ahead of what the market is uh, wanting, then you have to source differently. So most of our uh, uh, writers are public policy, have public policy background, you know, masters in sociology, economics, and so on. So the journalists, that is, uh, people like me try and convert that into uh, uh, stories that, you know, whatever, everyone can understand. So that's, uh, uh, I, I think, it's a sort of uh, something that the situation forces you to uh, innovate and, and uh, come up uh, with, with a solution that sort of works. Okay. Uh, again, if there are questions, feel free to interject at any point of time. Um, uh, other we're very close to winding up. The one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, can I ask you to uh, do a quick prediction five years from now? I mean, there are many people who say that for 10 to 20 years you will see this uh, as um, a parallel existence of the old media and the new media. Some people say in as, uh, as little as few as five years, you'll see newspapers getting pretty much uh, wiped out. What are your predictions? No, because I think um, um, levels of literacy in this country are still growing. And internet penetration is still quite low. And so the first uh, sort of stage that people will transit to would still be a newspaper. And I, I think that the Why? Younger people, people will not transfer uh, to newspaper. I suspect they will. And the, I think sort of there are just too many newspaper readers, readers in this country for this sort of dramatic American kind of thing to happen so quickly. We're at a different stage of uh, socioeconomic development. I think and I might this be is, this surprised is, there. Sorry, I was just, just missing one minute for a question. You see, the thing is, uh, the dream of uh, many journalists and editors to uh, break away and have startups and build teams and all that. And uh, I, mean, I I happen to, in a very small way, uh, do a bit of that in Goa. But what really happens is that ultimately that invisible hand of the entrepreneur who wants to get his own uh, own deal done or his own interest service comes in. And uh, so that, isn't that a, that a huge challenge? Because I uh, personally kind of burnt my bridges a little bit and kind of ran away back into the fold of a uh, more, more comfortable, uh, larger publication. So uh, the issue is that uh, isn't that isn't that a constant challenge, especially in, in smaller towns. Uh, in Bombay and other places, you'll obviously have the big VC or uh, other funder coming in. But uh, you know, in small ways, it becomes a bit of a problem. But both of you should address that because you are both the invisible entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, no, no. It's a fair point. I think, but uh, I mean, finally. It's like, you know, Ramnath Koenka was an entrepreneur too, but I think his interests and the uh, interests of Indian Express as a newspaper with its focus on uh, hard journalism are fairly aligned. And as you go back in history, you will find that hap has happened in many cases. I think the problem is more uh, post-19, post liberalization post, uh, maybe even more post-2001. Then again, I think if you look at the factors of uh, production, as they say, it's really oversupply leading to uh, breakdown of business model, leading to breakdown of the content model. I didn't want to, I mean, I, I missed that point earlier, you know, you talked about this uh, uh, company that raised money and, uh, you know, so But I would draw a very, very clear distinction and I'm, because I'm immersed in this world, I feel it even more strongly. I think there is a very clear distinction between journalism and content. You know, journalism may be content, but content is not journalism. But that's in your mind. No, no, of course it's in my mind. But, I mean, I think we all know broadly what is journalism. Journalism is about telling stories, it's about going on ground, reporting, uh, uh, trying to investigate something, trying to provide objectivity, but I mean, but not necessarily entertain. I think, yes, of course, uh, the, any product that entertains uh, will, will surely draw in more viewers than one that doesn't. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, there is no need for the other. You know, I'll give you a very, uh, a very uh, a well-known example, you know. So, uh, in television, again, a word I'm familiar with, only about 7 or 8% of total viewership is news, right? So, 94 93% or thereabouts of people don't even care about news are more interested in entertainment. So, and it's also, if you now start extending it, there are only that many people who get up every morning and want to know what's happened around them in the world. Right? And we are, all of us are only addressing those 6 or 7% of that population. We have to be very clear about that. You know, we can't be thinking that, you know, oh, there is that other part who, you know, we want to uh, convert into our readers and make them interested about issues and stuff like that. They are not interested. And I, I think as long as soon as you acknowledge that, things become a little simpler. So content will go into the other 94%, journalism will go into the first 6%, is, is, what, is how I would see. Final words, Naresh, on that? So, um, we do not know what we do not know. And it's sort of, which is what makes it so exciting. Uh, 
But I think it's sort of we're going to find our feet quite soon. Uh, it has to, uh, because there are just so many readers there. And um, sort of commerce and, and journalism will converge and establish an equilibrium. Great. So the bottom line is we are on the cusp of a brave new era. Thank you so much.